Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Udang dhamman sanghan namasam. All right, friends. So, continue to to sit, to be mindful, and um, just consider. So, tomorrow, um, Bhante Jayasara and I will be doing a um, joint um, online retreat. For those who have the opportunity to tap into that, it's uh, just uh, it's not really a themed retreat not really very rigorous in terms of pra uh, practice, but it is an opportunity to do exactly what we're doing now, to have a bit of meditation, bit of precepts, bit of, um, you know, hearing the Dhamma and considering it. And so going into a retreat, it's always good to uh, reflect on the essentials. And what are the essentials? Well, I mean, if you ever have the question, look at the Eightfold Path and say, okay, well, how do I do that? And one part of the Eightfold Path that um, has been coming up again and again over the last few weeks is that of mindfulness, samasati. And sati is a very interesting concept. The Buddha uses a word that directly relates to memory or remembering. And he says, you know, you've got sati when you can easily recall things that have been said or done um, long in the past. But I mean, just having a good memory is not what the Buddha is getting at in terms of like an enlightenment factor. That's a, it's kind of a symptom of having mindfulness. But what is mindfulness itself? And so I was saying with a meditation group recently, um, when we look at the, the translation word mindfulness, it is actually almost a better word than sati itself. Like I said, sati kind of refers to memory, but mindfulness is a Christian term. And it was used to, uh, for a sense of practice. Mindfulness is the activity of trying to remember something, uh, uh, recollect something during your daily activity. So the Christian monastics were trying to recollect God, um, continuously all throughout the day and everything they were doing. And when the Buddha talks about samasati or right mindfulness, true mindfulness, he is in fact referring to that kind of activity, uh, a sense of re returning our mind again and again to important basic realities about what's going on, um, remembering to look at what's right in front of us. You know, why is it a remembering? because it's not our it's not our instinct our instinct is actually to be off imagining things um to be thinking to be distracted um to be indulging in this or that pleasant feeling and that is our basic state so um, developing mindfulness is the antidote to that it's to be like okay wait what's actually happening and when we start to do this, we realize it, it takes effort. It takes the application of energy. And this is our first hint that, you know, most of what we're doing, whether we're doing it enthusiastically or we're doing it um, just out of habit, it doesn't take much energy. Um, we, could, we could watch TV for hours at a time. It takes no energy. We could um, read a newspaper for hours at a time. It doesn't take much energy. It's like most of the things that we do habitually are just giving in to that state and letting a habit pattern kind of run our activities. <laughs> but um, the turning of mindfulness is uh, an intentional activity. So we, we remember oh yeah, I should be here for this. I should be, I should be paying attention. And the Buddha, um, he doesn't just say that all mindfulness, all remembering, all coming to the present moment. In fact, he, he never really used this term of coming to the present moment. 
he did use a term of um, bringing your mindfulness to the forefront or facing forward, but it was just a sort of idiom. Um, we've, we've developed this idea of being in the present moment, in the present moment, in the present era, simply because we're so often in the past or the future. We've got our little planners, our little devices, and we're, we're anywhere but right here. So we refer to being in the present moment, but um, just being in the present moment is not necessarily samasati, because actually, as it turns out, <laughs> the present moment is the only place we can be. Uh, even when we're at our most deluded, uh, we think we're somewhere else, but the mind and body are still in fact right here. They're just clouded and confused. So the Buddha offers what are called the satipatthana, the four uh, bases or foundations of mindfulness as a sort of framework for us to properly direct our, our mindfulness, us to properly remember um, things within a structure so that we're paying attention to the right things. And I thought um, going into a retreat, but also just in general, it's always nice to review this framework and kind of tease out the nuances because um, I'm sure you all uh, um, meditators, practitioners, so you've probably found that if you've been doing this for a few weeks or a few years or a few decades, you're still cultivating mindfulness. You're still remembering to come back to the basics. And that's good. You know, this is, this is what it means to, to care. This is what it means to understand our situation. Uh, forgetting is natural, but remembering um, takes intention. And so remembering the satipatthana, um, let's see if we take a few minutes and kind of go back over the structure, jog our memory, and maybe that'll help, um, help it to come up at important times. Um, when we're sitting to meditate, maybe we can run through the list or um, just, just think quickly, like, am I right now paying attention to one of these bases of mindfulness or have I been um, lost in a tangent? It can help anchor us. So the four foundations of mindfulness are um, the body, kaya, vedana, and feelings, um, the chitta, or the mind, and dhamma, or um, uh, things. But uh, in terms of structures or teachings, uh, frameworks that we can apply our, our mind to, that fourth category is actually where thoughts are showing up, but not just being aware of any old thought or any old psychology or this or that is useful. That category deals with um, literally thoughts on Dhamma. So the first foundation of mindfulness, and for those who will be at the retreat, I'll um, also take a look at this on Sunday um, in one of the Dhamma talks, is mindfulness of the body. And this Satipatthana is very, uh, it, it's, it's interesting in terms of, we have this dichotomy in the Satipatthana between objective realities and subjective realities. What do, what do these mean? Objective means fact, means there's, a, there's an actual thing there that can be agreed upon. And subject deals with our experience of that thing. It's personal to us, our subjective reality. So um, like um, th there is a body here and you're all seeing the body. That's an objective reality. But the subjective reality is how you feel about it, what color it looks like. You've all got different, different monitors. You're seeing it with a different you know, uh, brightness and contrast and all of these things, different frame rates, different, um, uh, we say pixels. And, and so you're all having a different subjective reality of it. But this first basis of mindfulness doesn't pay attention to subjective realities, which is, which is very interesting because the other three do. They deal with what we're experiencing as well as what's there. But the first one, the Buddha is encouraging us to remember simply what is here. 
And so the paying attention to the base of mindfulness in the body is to look at the physical body. And the second we do this, we start to realize, well, we're interpreting a lot and we're assuming a lot. We've got a lot of ideas about the body and remembering the objective body, the thing that's actually here kind of pulls us out of our mind, pulls us out of our stories and allows us to, uh, it, it's cooling, it's simplifying, it's grounding. It's literally the most grounded possible thing we can focus on. Um, because it's kind of it's kind of teasing us out of the swirl of mental activity and saying, okay, well, it, it's it's physical, it can be known. So there's no reason to doubt it. You do have a body. Uh, even those of you who have your 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 cameras off, I'm quite confident you have a body. Because that's what it takes to be alive here on planet Earth. You know, gotta have one of those. And now what is it? The first, uh, there's, a, there's a whole list of ways that we can remember the body. And the first one is, is as simple. I also know that you're all breathing um, because the only times you stop breathing are when you're dead or when you're in the fourth jhana. And if you're in the fourth jhana, you wouldn't be hearing me. So it wouldn't really matter. I'm right by default. But if you're, if you're dead, then I don't know how you logged in or I'm, I'm very sorry, somebody's you know, it's, you'll probably be here until I close the stream. But um, if you are alive, if you're hearing this, then in fact, you're breathing. And you always have been since, you know, since you came out of the womb, you've been breathing. And so this can be known at any moment, you can turn your mind to this and be like, oh, yeah, I, I forgot I'm breathing. And some of the uh, some of the all around best meditators, including the Buddha himself, used this basis of mindfulness as their main meditation object to remember the breath at all times. And if you do yoga or you do calisthenics, you've probably also found out that um, paying attention to the breath is the secret to doing that good. But most of our physical activities, if we're doing them at a pace where we can still breathe naturally, we're gonna do them well and we're not gonna be fatigued. It's the moment where uh, we're straining and we're not breathing properly that the activity becomes draining, it becomes difficult. It's the same with the mind. When we strain the mind, when we're reaching for things, when we're clinging to things, when we're um, resisting things, often the body also becomes tense. It reflects that. It reflects the emotional state and therefore the breath becomes tense, becomes uneven, it becomes localized in different parts of the body. Uh, and probably because it's not comfortable, we become ignorant of it. We tune it out. We become more focused on the thing that we're, we're attached to. And so that moment where we're saying, oh yeah, yeah, breathe, 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 breathe. We're focusing on the balancing effect of our mind. We're saying, well, okay, I can pay attention to things, but not to the point that I become tense, attached, um, deluded, confused, angry. That would be too much. It moderates us. So just coming back to it, if, if we're breathing, which we probably are, then we can be aware of that. And that grounds us. It's an objective reality, always breathing. Even, even if it's difficult to perceive, yeah, it's there. And the Buddha goes into um, postures and activities. And these throughout the Pali Canon, these are a, a very specific way that the Buddha refers to mindfulness and what's called Sampajanya, clear comprehension. That deals with what is, what is the body doing? Where is it and what is it, to, what is it doing? That, and that's kind of where we, we have this whole be in the now thing is really about. Like, it's doing something. Even if you're sitting here, how is it sitting? What is it sitting on? Where is it sitting? What's the room like? You know, it's you, just taking a moment to, to uh, tap into that is to take a moment to tap out of what you think is going on, which is probably quite, quite a drama to be honest, if your mind is anything like my, my mind, then you know what you, th you think is going on at any possible moment. It's like, oh, I'm doing this for the, for the, 
for the good of the country and for all sentient beings and because I'm so responsible and wise and clear headed. And when you, you stop and you remember, it's like, oh no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just cleaning this thing. That's all. I'm just, it's a body wiping a table. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's not that complicated. And that, that's, that's very grounding. Again, it's very moderating and it's objective. So you can know what the body is doing. You can know how it's sitting and what activity it's engaged in. And it allows you to strip off all the subjective um, stuff that's added on top. Then uh, we get into two categories that deal with the body in terms of its composition, that is its anatomy, and in terms of its composition in terms of elements. And this is the four great elements um, in Buddhism is um, earth, water, fire, and wind. And these are just basic forces of solidity, uh, forces of cohesion, forces of um, warmth or vitality, and forces of energy or movement. Um, the first one, anatomy, um, we, th we think we see the bodies of the people around us, but do we really? Or are we trying to you know, kind of turn down the volume on the things that we find um, gross or unattractive? Do we, we have an idea? Okay, this is so-and-so, they're, they're so great, they're so strong, they're so awesome. If we tune into the anatomy, we're like, oh, well, that's all just a construct, yeah? There, it's, it's, this is, there's, there's guts there. It's, it's, I mean, it's very productive guts, but it's just guts. And that's the, it's, it's, it's also very universal, yeah? You know, tapping into this is remembering that we all got guts. We're all, you know, these kind of meat popsicles that get up and kind of walk around and do things. And it can, it can become kind of lighthearted. It can become kind of simple. It's like, why did I take this so seriously? And so you got a pain and you, know, you try to figure out where the pain is and you realize, I have no idea. You know, it's, it's, it is in the joint, is it in the muscles, it is in the bone. It doesn't seem like it's, it's in any of those things. And that helps us see. There's this subjective sense of pain but what, what are the nerves actually doing? Because they're the only thing that can actually signal pain, right, to the brain. And you look at the anatomy and they're like, oh yeah, they're, they're firing, but all they're saying is tingle. You know, it's, it's my brain and my mind and my subjective reality that's making a big deal out of that. Whereas if I, just, I just calm down and say, okay, yeah, you know, this is the bag of guts is, is sitting here and it seems to be running, you know, like a car that's kind of, you know, idling at a stoplight it's working. So I don't, I don't need to freak out. But that can be very, very grounding, very simplifying. And if anything is going to help you to understand concepts like not self, then, you know, take some hair or take a tooth or take a nail and be like, well, you know, not too long ago, I thought that was me. And now look at it. I, I don't, I just want to throw it out. You know, it's, it's a real clue. In terms of the elements, I mean, it doesn't, <clears throat> it's basically the same idea, yeah? We take all the solid parts and we look at it and we're like, well, that's just solid parts. It's just like all the other solid parts in the world. It's no different. We take all the, the, the cohesive uh, force of, that we call water and we're like, yeah, there's, li there's liquid in here, but there's also the, the, the liquid that holds all the solid together. Um, we would just kind of poof, turn into a pile of dust if not for all the water kind of saturating our tissues. And so there's cohesion binding us and there's warmth. Again, if we're not dead, there's more warmth than there should be. We're generating it. There's, there's movement, there's metabolism. And then there's wind. Uh, again, um, if the if something is moving somewhere, something's flowing, something's transitioning and changing state, then there's energy in the system. And it's not us doing it. It's, it's happening within the context of the body. So if we think of the, we think of the wind or uh, we think of you know, things falling because of gravity, you know, we're not doing that. It's just happening. And all of the physical processes, again, we don't have to think when we swallow, okay, no, 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 it goes down, right? We, we swallow something, you know, we don't have to make it go down. It's like, 
just all these processes happen on their own. And so it releases us and remembering this again, balances us and roots us in the space of mindfulness. And the final one is um, just remembering the body has the nature to decay. And I find this to be an extremely um, calming and clarifying uh, reflection. And again, I, I'll, I'll go over it on Sunday as well, but uh, there's all sorts of ways of doing this. There's, there's some categorical cemetery contemplations, but in terms of remembering, in terms of sati, we're turning towards these things, yeah? So we're turning towards a reality that's easy to miss and is present right in front of us. And that's the right reality. Um, it, this thing that I'm doing, would I still be so uh, caught up in it if I knew I was going to die? If I was really aware that I was going to die? If I was really seeing how things break down and decay, would I be working so hard or so attached to this particular thing? Um, sometimes we, we really would. We really would just clean the table because you know, whether or not we're gonna die, it's just we made a mess and we're just cleaning up after ourselves. Uh, but sometimes we would say, oh, wow, I'm really building up a story and I'm really getting indignant and I'm really getting angry over this thing. And I can only sustain that if I'm certain I'm going to live an, you know, a, a good long time so that I can get over this anger in the future. You know, I'll be angry now and I'll get over it in the future. The moment we remember, it's like, oh, I can die at any moment. I, I don't even know how this thing keeps living anyway. It seems improbable. The moment we remember that, it's like, oh, I got to let go of anger right now. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I'll have time later. This anger is not in, in a good thing to hold on to. It's not that important. I'd be much better off without it. And so all of these things uh, are kind of planting ourselves. And the Buddha uses a simile. It's like if you've got all these different animals, you know, roaming around and you wanted to, um, uh, to get them to, to stop causing chaos, you might hammer a post into the ground and then tie a leash to each one. And um, they'd still wander around a bit but they'd only wander around within um, the range of the leashes. And in the same way, the, the, the Buddha simile, the post is the body, is mindfulness of the body. It, it roots us right here and in, in this physical reality and the context of what's actually happening. Everything else will be story. Everything else will be subjective, um, but the body is not. It's just, it's the, Buddha, the Buddha called it old karma. You know, it's already emotion. The ball is already rolling downhill. We think that we're, we're having a real profound effect on it, but yeah, not really. Yeah, not really. It's kind of its own, it's its own thing playing out. It's its own um, little causal processes. Yeah. Now the other three bases of mindfulness, um, again, these are more open-ended. They deal with subjective realities. So I'll maybe just give a, a few suggestions of how we might consider them, look at them, um, uh, see the difference between these two things. So the second base of mindfulness is Vedana, our feelings. And canonically, um, there's pleasant feeling, there's unpleasant feeling, and there's neither pleasant nor unpleasant or neutral, if you will. And these are the three kinds of feelings. And in the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha um, says you can notice them internally in terms of your subject, subjective experience, and you can notice them externally in terms of objective experience. And so external would be, um, yeah, you put, your, you put your hand into some boiling water, the nerves are gonna say, this is a bad thing. Um, you don't eat today. Uh, your stomach is going to be telling you, yeah, we're hungry. This is unpleasant. Yeah, we're, we're, we can only do this for so long and then we're dead. You know, you're going to get these, these really tangible, uh, pleasant, unpleasant, doesn't really matter experiences. Like probably um, when you first sit down in a chair, you know, it's a little bit pleasant, you know, because you were standing or you were walking and it's, it's more restful, yeah? Um, you're there for a few minutes and it becomes neutral. 
you know, very easily start forgetting about parts of your body because you don't, you don't need to work against gravity. You're there a bit longer, 10, 15, 20 minutes, it starts becoming painful. Your body's saying, okay, why don't we get up again? And if you, you stick with it, as in meditation, then you'll, you'll find it, it'll start going through all of these back and forth. And this is a base of mindfulness, is to say, um, remember, remember that that's all that's happening. You know, it's not the chair is too stiff, or I'm getting too old, or um, I really worked so hard today, and now it's, um, this is exactly what I needed. This is exactly the rest I needed. It's like, that's all story, yeah? Um, just looking at the Vedana, just looking at the experience, a pleasant, painful, neutral, kind of brings us into clarity of, okay, well, this is happening in the present moment. And again, it allows us to relax a little. Like, okay, I don't need a story. This is pleasant. That's okay. This is unpleasant. Don't have to freak out. This is neutral. I see if I can be mindful of it. Otherwise, I'll get bored. I'll get lost. I'll get confused. I'll get deluded. So even this is worth being aware of, reminding ourselves of. And then there's internal Vedana, which is dealing with our, our mental experience, our subjective mental experience. And this is um, probably, <clears throat> if this were expounded, it would be looking at more of the tendencies, yeah? So when um, pleasant feeling is increasing, that's pleasant. But when pleasant feeling is decreasing, that's unpleasant. We, uh, we wanted it to hang around. When painful feeling is increasing, that's unpleasant. But when it's decreasing, that's kind of pleasant. We're like, oh, it's getting better, thank goodness. It's a relief. When neutral feeling is unknown, when it's unclear, when it's murky, it's unpleasant. Yeah, we're like, oh, what is that? But when it's known, it's pleasant. We're like, ah, ah, it's so good to be alive. Ah. That's what it feels like to be mindful, actually. It kind of, you know, makes all of the different Vedanas okay. Yeah. yeah, we realize we don't have to freak out. We don't have to apply these extra labels. You know, the Buddha simile of the second dart. You know, the first dart is the feeling. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't avoid it because you didn't know it was coming. We don't necessarily know in advance things are going to be uh, pleasurable or painful or neutral. But the second dart is the one we can avoid. It's that, that story, that internal subjective experience. And if it still comes, if we're still like, wow, th this hurts and I want it gone now, if we really do multiply it, then we can be aware of that. We're like, I'm reacting to this. And if we react to the reaction, we'll just make it worse. So in that way, even being mindful of our reactions, even being mindful of our underlying tendencies is better than not. Yeah? Just, just remembering, okay, there are these underlying tendencies will we'll help us start to catch them and start to get over them. The third base of mindfulness is, is pretty vague. It's dealing with the mind, yeah? And so um, objective and subjective is getting really kind of um, fuzzy at this point, but uh, the objective realities are going to be, um, you know, what's present in the mind, what kind of mood is in the mind. And we can get to know these. Is there greed, hatred, and delusion present? Um, at first, you know, everybody's going like, oh, you're deluded, I'm not deluded. But after a while, when we start practicing mindfulness, we're like, I'm saying angry things. So even though, even though I can't really tell where it's coming from, I'm pretty sure my mind is in an angry mood. And as we keep reflecting on that, it's like, I'm saying angry things. So therefore I can know my mind is in an angry mood. We start to get a sense of what angry mood feels like, what it, how it affects things, what it's built off of. We kind of figure out what our triggers are. And we're like, okay, yeah, that, that thing got to me. And I, I can kind of feel I'm on edge. 
You know, the same with, with greedy, you know, we're, we might have no greed in the mind and we're not aware of really wanting anything. And then we smell something we're like, oh, that smells really good. I wonder what that is. And we start thinking about what it is. We start thinking about smearing butter all over it. And we start thinking, oh, maybe I can have two or three. Maybe somebody will give me one. Before we know it, you know, we've got greed in the mind. Like, oh, it was triggered, it created a mood. That mood conditions certain thoughts. This is knowing the objective reality of our mind. We can also know when those aren't present. When they're not present, we're like, yeah, there's no, there's no greed right now. There's, there's no hatred right now. It's a little hard to know that there's no delusion right now because usually when you're deluded, you, you think you're not deluded and that's what it means to be deluded. But you can still, you know, especially if your character type is susceptible to delusion, um, you might start to nevertheless uh, catch the theme and start to see it when it's it's coming your way. You'd be like, yeah, I probably don't know what I'm talking about. I'm gonna I'm gonna slow down here and I'm gonna really think about what I'm saying. Uh, there might be some delusion present, or I might not know that as well as I think I do. The Buddha also um, gives some other things that we can look for. Is the mind bright or is it dull? Is it expansive or is it contracted? Um, is it concentrated or is it distracted? You know, these are um, basic things that we can kind of clue into, um, especially for meditators. Uh, this is how sati starts to bring us to the, to the doorstep of samadhi. And samadhi is a uh, continuity of mindfulness. It makes our, our sati uh, firm and unshakable um, and, and solid. You know, no matter what happens, we, we catch it. We're aware of it. So when we start to, to really see what makes our mind focus, what makes our mind bright, what makes our mind calm, when we start to uh, remember these things and checking in, we start to figure out what causes them, you know? And that's when we start getting good because we'll probably want them more often. Now, some of these are, are um, there's neither one is good or bad. And in that case, we just, we just notice it as it is. And it's good to not try to make it good or bad. Like if the mind is expansive or contracted, if we're trying to focus on one thing, contracted is good. But if we're trying to just be calm and aware and expansive, like when we're cultivating the Brahma Viharas, you know, the pleasant emotions, then we might want an expansive mind, yeah? And then we might start to see if we're checking in again and again over the course of the day, we might see how that's changing. How it's not really, it's not really something we can flex like a muscle. It's more built up over time. It's more like a momentum. And we'll kind of get the drift of when that momentum is taking us in one direction or when it's taking us in another. And the fourth uh, basis of mindfulness actually during the weekend um, is more or less going to be Bhante Jay's uh, area of, of discussion. Um, so we, we have dhammas. And basically, dhamma is a catch-all word. It means thing. It means reality. It means truth. It means teaching. Um, but in terms of dhammas, uh, the fourth basis of mindfulness is to be aware of our thoughts and to catch them as they're coming up, to remember we are thinking. Um, to, well, the reality is thoughts are arising. You know, we, we sometimes think, but most of the time there's just thoughts. These thoughts are just kind of like spitting out based on, you know, our habits and our patterns and our past conditioning. Now the thinking is really important because the thinking deals with how, what we make of those thoughts, what we do with them, how we contextualize them, how we try to string them together in certain ways, or ideally, how we, how we let them go. When we, when we think about them in clear ways, you know, we realize they're impermanent, they're, they're momentary. You know, the, the best thoughts are those thoughts that um, dwindle away on their own, yeah? The, the, the tricky thoughts are the ones that, that have a hook that are really catchy and seductive that kind of lead you on and on and on and on and lead to more thoughts and more thoughts and more thoughts like cockroaches breeding. Um, but the good thoughts are like, oh yeah, that was an in-breath or oh, that was an out-breath or yeah, I'm gonna die someday or uh, here I am sitting in the chair. 
those don't go anywhere. Those are great thoughts. But even more specifically in terms of the fourth Satipatthana is um, looking at the Buddha's uh, teachings, looking at the Four Noble Truths, looking at the Five Faculties, looking at um, basically all of what are called the Bodhipakya Dhammas, the 37 um, teachings that the Buddha reiterated in the last year of his life. He's like, yeah, if you're gonna remember anything about the 45 years of teachings that I've given, remember these things. And it's just a bunch of lists. The Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, the 10 Paramis, the Four uh, Bases of Success, you know, Five Faculties, Five Powers, you know, good stuff, good stuff. To, and the thing is, any one of those lists is good enough. If in any moment of the day, you can be like, well, what would it be like to look at this moment in terms of the five khandas, the five aggregates? Okay, well, this would be the body aggregate. That would be the feeling aggregate. That would be memory. That would be a habit pattern. Oh, and I'm conscious, yeah. And in just that activity, we have done, uh, we've done something profound. Specifically, we have not done something in a profound way. What we have not done is relied on conventional folk ideas of what's really going on in the world. And these are sometimes, they're sometimes clever, they're sometimes constructive, but often they're misleading because um, everybody is born with some measure of ignorance. If you had no ignorance, you would not have been born. Again, I can say that categorically. Um, but because everybody is born with even a tiny bit of ignorance, then what happens is the ideas that we share in talking and discussing things and reflecting on things are a little bit tainted by that ignorance. The delusion of an idea of self or the delusion of something is permanent or the delusion that something is, is pleasant and really, and really great and worthwhile and awesome and, and all of that. Um, so these ideas seep in there. So some of the things that we've been taught over the course of our life are just, they're just, it's just good. It's just a rule of thumb, you know, you know, how to bake bread. It's like, yeah, you follow the recipe, you know, it's the recipe's not useless. But if you're trying to, uh, you're trying to uh, lead your life, you know, the, the recipes and uh, my mother always said, and uh, this and that, those, those are good, but those are not necessarily going to ground us. Those are not necessarily going to encompass everything. They're usually very specific. They're usually talking about a certain thing. And almost inevitably, they're talking about that thing from a certain angle. It'll work for one person in one situation, but it might not work for another person in another situation. And that's where the, the lists that the Buddha points out uh, are, are good. Uh, because like uh, you take any of those lists, like the five aggregates, you can, everything will fit within those five aggregates. Or if you take the six sense bases, well, everything you're experiencing is going to land in one of those six sense bases. If you're looking at the four noble truths, then yeah, that'll really contextualize a lot of stuff for you. And for, for a moment or for a minute or for an hour, if you're able to remember that frame of reference, if you're able to come back to it again and again and again, then you're bound to start seeing the world in a different way, in a way that's conducive to more mindfulness, in a way that's conducive to more wisdom, in a way that will actually lead to samadhi, because it'll, uh, if you're seeing things in the, in the right way, you'll start to let go. Yeah, it's just like the first base of mindfulness. You'll be like, wait, okay, so there's two things. There's this thought, and then there's my subjective experience of this thought and the things that have conditioned this thought. And now that I see that both of those are happening, I see that there's no self involved. All of this is just this, this thing that's rattling it, going out of control based on past conditions. And if I can just breathe, <laughs> I can just chill, then it's going to, it's going to get better. It's going to get, it's, it's going to get even, it's going to get balanced. Things are going to start making sense when I start you know, using one of these categorical teachings so that everything has its place. And it's amazing, as I've said again and again, that's one of the, the beautiful things about something like the Four Noble Truths. Four Noble Truths is the first Noble Truth deals with suffering. 
And most of the teachings in the world view suffering as you know, a bad thing. And they try, to, they try to get rid of it. You know, do this, you can go to heaven, you can be happy for eternity. But in the Buddhist teaching, suffering, it, it fits within the container. It has a slot, yeah? And that means that even our pain, even our challenges, even our vulnerability, even our um, regrets can shape us, can be valuable. We can learn from them. They can connect us. They can help us empathize with other people because they even even something that we, we talk crap about so much, like suffering, even that has a place within these teachings. Even that gets to fit. Everything gets to fit. It all gets to make sense in a way that doesn't leave us spinning, which is what we'll be if we're not developing our sati. So I've gone on and on. And um, I, I offer this for your reflection tonight, this being the new moon. And, you know, um, again, I just I salute everybody who's, who's taken on some precepts and who's uh, giving minds to these things and developing their practice. And it's a delight to be able to um, share this evening of practice with you. So I'll stop there. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. sadhu, sadhu. sadhu.